Good evening. My name is Larry Few. I'm the director of this Global Affairs Center, and it's my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Ambassador John Hamilton. He's told me he doesn't like to be called ambassador, but I had to say it at least once. I'll say it more than once, actually. Uh, tonight's topic is Guatemala, sometimes known as the land of the eternal spring. Guatemala has a complex national identity. About half the population, not quite half, is indigenous Mayan, most of whom live in poverty. The 20th century was not very kind to Guatemala. There was a series of military and civilian governments that went back and forth. There were problems of crime and corruption. There was a degree of concentration of the wealth uh, that seemed to be off the charts, and I think it still is. Uh, there was a 36 guerrilla war that left some 2,000 people dead. Uh, in a country that today has 50 million people, but during the time of the conflict, it ended in 96, it had, during that 36 year span, between 10 and 12 million people, I think. So 200,000 uh, people killed, uh, mostly civilians, uh, is, is a large number. Um, so there was a 36 year civil war. The 21st century so far has had its own ups and downs and its own tragedies. Uh, there was a president, a sitting president, who resigned just this last September, two months ago. There was a new president elected just last week. Um, and there was a massive mudslide on the outskirts of Guatemala City in, on October 1st, I believe was the date, in which uh, I believe the, number, the last thing I saw was the number of dead was more than 250, and there were scores that were still missing. So. The 21st century has had its own ups and downs. Uh, the United States has not always been very kind during this past century, hindering as much as helping Guatemala. Uh, there was an overthrow of a civilian government in 1954 that had US fingerprints on it quite a bit. Um, and that as the 21st century gets underway, the questions are, will Guatemala's domestic situation improve? Uh, we have seen some improvements, but as I mo mentioned a moment ago, there have been some steps backwards. Uh, has its relationship with the United States changed for the better? Here to, us, here to speak to us about all these issues, Guatemala's democratic development, its national challenges, and how all of that fits into a bilateral relationship with the United States is uh, Ambassador John Hamilton. I say it twice now. Uh, John Hamilton was the U.S. Ambassador from 2003 to 2005. Before that, from 1999 to 2002, he was U.S. Ambassador to Peru. And here's one of those full disclosure moments. I worked uh, for Ambassador Hamilton in Peru during that period, during most of that period. I think he left before I did. Uh, he's also served at the State Department in, a, uh, in Washington, D.C., in a variety of capacities that brought him into frequent contact with issues throughout Central America, not just Guatemala. He was a director of the Office of Central American Affairs. He was a deputy assistant secretary for the Central American and Caribbean and Cuban, so he has lots of experience. The focus tonight is on Guatemala, but I'm thinking that if, if people have questions about that go beyond Guatemala and talk about the Central America region, he can he's happy to try to respond to those questions as well. Uh, he is now retired and he lives in Shelton, Washington. Actually, he lives outside of Shelton, but his mail address is Shelton, Washington. Uh, and he lives with his wife, who herself is an accomplished US Foreign Service officer, now retired in her own right. So without further ado, um, I want to welcome John to the front and please give him a round of applause. Let me just say a few words about format, I forgot this. Uh, uh, Mr. Hamilton is gonna speak for about 30 minutes, and then he's agreed that he'll be taking some questions and answers. So at that time, I'll explain after he finishes a little bit more about how we're gonna handle the question and questions and answers. But thank you very much. John? On May 10th, 2009, which was a Sunday morning, a wealthy Guatemalan attorney by the name of Rodrigo Rosenberg uh, was assassinated in downtown Guatemala City. Three shots to the head. He had been out riding his bicycle. 
At his funeral, four days later, uh, his children distributed a video that he had made, as it turns out, just four days before he was killed. If you're viewing this video, he said, it's because I've been murdered. And then he went on to identify the person that he considered responsible for his murder. The president of Guatemala, Alvaro Colon, his wife, Sandra Torres, who just ran for president in these elections, and a presidential aide. Guatemalans, the time has come, he said in his conclusion. Please, it is time. Good afternoon. Well, this video was uploaded to YouTube and other online uh, sites. It went viral, as the cliche has it, sparking uh, national outrage and street protest of the kind that we've seen in Guatemala in the last few months. President Colom, for his part, categorically denied that he had had anything to do with the murder. But in the interview in which he made this denial, he struck people as being so nervous that he left everyone convinced that he was lying through his teeth. Uh, the protest continued. It looked like he was going to have to resign, maybe face arrest and, <clears throat> and stand trial. But Colomb, at, actually at the suggestion of our ambassador, um, turned to a UN investigative commission that had been especially created for Guatemala several years before. And he asked it to conduct a complete investigation into the murder of Mr. Rosenberg. Um, our ambassador helped by getting the FBI to come down and join and work with the UN Investigative Commission. And so the protests died down uh, while this inquiry was, investigation was being conducted. Four months later, the commission had um, concluded its investigation and its um, and its director, a Colombian, reported the stunning findings. Rosenberg, clinically depressed, and having convinced himself that a married woman with whom he was having an affair had been murdered by President Colomb, had hired hitmen to murder him in an effort to frame President Colomb and bring down his government. Uh, the evidence to back this, uh, the conclusion of this um, investigation was, for most people, pretty conclusive. It included evidence that Rosenberg had been in touch by phone just days before his murder with his killers. Uh, it turns out they thought they were killing somebody else, a person that, Colomb's, uh, that uh, Rosenberg said was uh, blackmailing him. That was the motive he gave them. This is why I want you to kill this guy. But it was him that he wanted them to kill, and they did, in the manner I've described. Well, there's a lot more to this utterly fascinating, almost unbelievable story. And it was really well told in a uh, article that appeared in The New Yorker in April of 2011, written by David Grand. <clears throat> but I begin with it because, <clears throat> sort of in the way that uh, a flash of lightning on a dark night reveals the lay of the land, I think this, this little anecdote illuminates something that is profoundly tragic and deeply uh, problematic about Guatemala. Guatemalans have seen so much violence from their police, from their military, from their political class. They've endured so many brutal, corrupt governments that they are prepared to believe um, almost any accusation against their political class of venality or violence, no matter how far-fetched or implausible. And I say far-fetched because I, I know Cologne, a sort of a more mild-mannered, sweet, 
utterly incapable of violence individual I don't think I've ever met. <laughs> but when it comes to their government, Guatemalans are profoundly cynical, distrustful, and prone to believe the very worst. And in my view, nothing creates a more difficult environment for democracy than pervasive cynicism. Let me tell you a, a, a second shorter anecdote that reveals to my mind something else about Guatemalans. When I arrived as ambassador in 2002, I had instructions to speak uh, very candidly to the president, Alfonso Portillo, about concerns in Washington that Guatemala was going off the rails of democratic development. Uh, the assessment I was given to convey was, was pretty harsh. It was very explicit and detailed. Uh, there were no diplomatic niceties in the presentation I was to make. This was my introductory meeting with the president. Uh, I did as I was told. I delivered this message in my first meeting with him. There were just the two of us there. He listened very attentively to what I had to say. It took a good 10 to 15 minutes. As I went on, um, his face darkened. Um, he frowned, his uh, brow furrowed, and when I finished, he just exploded. Señor embajador, lo que usted dice no es cierto. What you say, Mr. Ambassador, is not true. And then he breaks into English. Actually, the situation is much, much worse. So Guatemalan politicians may be corrupt and even violent. Uh, during his presidential campaign, this president had actually bragged of having killed two Mexican students in his youth in self-defense, he said. But it demonstrated that he would be capable of being tough on crime. But uh, this story also illustrated for me how charming, funny, and um, disarming they could be. I, I always enjoyed dealing with them. I also found Guatemalans to be enormously uh, talented. Of course, you know uh, Guatemala's pre-Columbian Mayan cultures were phenomenally advanced. And all that DNA that gave rise to those civilizations is still there. Uh, in modern times, Guatemalans have won uh, a Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, they won a Nobel Peace Prize, which isn't bad for a country that at the time was uh, fewer than 10 million people. But lest you think, well, they do OK, say, in uh, politics or in, uh, or in literature, but um, how are they in science or technology? Let me just cite the, the case of uh, Luis von Ahn. He is a 37-year-old Guatemalan who is a professor of computer sciences at Carnegie Mellon in, um, in Pennsylvania. And he was a pioneer, early pioneer in crowdsourcing. Um, and he invented the security feature that we've all come across on the internet called CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA is where you log on to a website and you have to type in squiggly, fuzzy letters, and this filters out the um, automatically robotic um, hacking scams because only a human being is able to recognize these letters and type them in. It was a young Guatemalan that came up with that uh, feature. But, and, and he was, a, he was educated, his college education was in the US, but he was a product of Guatemala's K through 12 education system. But for all this talent, uh, Guatemala has in recent years hovered on the brink of being a quote unquote failed state. Um, as Larry was saying, it's got one of the highest uh, rates of criminal violence in the world gangs that originated in immigrant communities in Los Angeles were deported back to Guatemala, uh, and um, gangs now plague 
all of the major cities and even a number of the, of the smaller towns all over Guatemala. They account for much of this, this violence. It's violence against each other, but it's not solely against each other. Every sector of Guatemalan society uh, feels victimized by, um, by the amount of criminal violence there. By the time I left Guatemala, I had come to the view that the greatest threat to democracy was public attitudes that so much wanted security, they would put up with any level of state repression in order to just put an end to the criminal violence that they felt that they were subject to in their daily lives. Um, drug cartels, another source of violence organized crime. At first they were Colombian, and then the Mexicans came in. Now the uh, drug cartels operating in Guatemala are largely, gu are largely Guatemalan. Uh, they operate with virtual impunity. As long ago as 2002, when I arrived there, this vast Petén region um, that extends on up uh, with Belize on the, on the east, and Mexico on the rest, west, where most of the pre-Columbian ruins are located, was largely under de facto control of the drug cartels. Um, Guatemala's economy does relatively well. Um, it's reasonably uh, well diversified. Uh, especially uh, taking into consideration that we're talking about a developing country economy. But um, investment, both domestic and foreign, is held back by three things. The security concerns that I've been discussing, a lack of skilled workers, and a very poorly developed infrastructure in Guatemala. Um, Guatemala is about the size of Ohio. But whereas Ohio has 100,000 miles, over 100,000 miles of paved road, Guatemala has less than 3,000 miles of paved road. Its agricultural sector is especially unproductive. And although the economy as a whole has grown 3 to 4% a year in recent years, this is far too slow to create enough jobs for a rapidly growing population. As a result, Guatemala's largest export is labor. Um, Guatemala earns an estimated $5.3 billion in 2013 from remittances of Guatemalans who come to the United States to work, um, largely undocumented, uh, sent back to, to Guatemala. This is far more than Guatemala earns from any of its leading exports. And it's um, by a factor of 8 to 10 um, larger than all of the foreign aid that Guatemala receives from all sources put together. Uh, now, for many years, uh, immigration, this undocumented or illegal, if you wish, immigration to the United States tended to be seasonal. And it was also circular in nature, by which I mean, like Mexicans, Guatemalans would migrate north for the agricultural season and then return home for several months uh, during the off season. Uh, but more effective patrolling of the U.S. border in the last 10 to 15 years has had an unintended consequence. Because they cannot now count on being able to get back in if they go home to visit their family that they left behind in Guatemala, the agricultural workers who come here illegally are staying put. This has led to virtually permanent uh, separation of parents from children. A lot of the mothers have immigrated too, uh, with the horrendous social costs that you can imagine from this. It has been a major factor in the last two years of the new phenomenon of, of minors, children, uh, making the journey to the United States unaccompanied by any adult relative. Um, you've all heard about this mass migration of unaccompanied children from Central America, particularly from Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador. 
Now, a triggering factor, there are many, many reasons that this is going on. A triggering factor was um, a change to the US law to combat trafficking in persons that was made in 2008. Um, are you familiar with the term trafficking in persons? This is what we're talking about with when people are against their will put into the sex industry or they are put into a de facto situation of, of forced labor um, against their will. And um, we have federal legislation that mandates us to combat trafficking in persons worldwide. Now, in 2008, a change was made to the U.S. law because they had started to see um, children coming from Central America unaccompanied by adults. And the supposition was, it's one thing if young Mexican boys are coming across the border, but when they're coming from as far away as, they are, as Guatemala or Honduras or Salvador, the, the, um, the premise was, this is probably trafficking in persons that's going on. So before we deport these people, we want to make sure um, that they get a, a, a full-scale immigration hearing before uh, in an immigration court, um, and so that their situation can be investigated and we know what we're dealing with before a decision is made to send them back or to give them refuge in the United States. Now, complicating factor. Uh, we don't want to put children into detention centers while they're awaiting this hearing. So they are released into the custody of a family member who's already in the United States. And these children arrive prepared to tell immigration officers when they're picked up where their nearest relative in the United States lives. And so the hearing then may take months or even a year or two to get scheduled. And by the time they are finally called to come to their hearing, they and the family to which they've been um, entrusted, supposedly on a temporary basis, have changed residence, disappeared into the, into the woodwork of the 48 states. So the, the de facto consequence of the change to the two, 2008 law, together with other things going on, was that children who made it into the United States were not being deported at all. And that, as the word got back, um, I think accentuated the, and led to this mass outpouring of families trying to get, the, who, families, you know, adults, Guatemalans who couldn't get back for the reasons I've stated to visit their children, sent for their children, and they, and they came up. Um, Larry mentioned as well, income inequality. Uh, I mean, we all know, it's been so much in our own public discourse, how destructive of social cohesion income inequality is. Um, it's quite extreme in Guatemala. Um, economists have come up with a single number measure of income inequality called the Gini coefficient. Uh, this is a number on a scale of 1 to 100. If everybody in the country has the same income, the country has a Gini coefficient of 1. And if one person in the country has all of the income, then they have a, a, a a Gini coefficient of 100. So you'll be somewhere in the middle. Uh, anything above 35 to 40 is considered very high. Um, ours, the US Gini coefficient, is currently at 41. Sweden's, which is the most equitable society on Earth, has a Gini coefficient of 25. Guatemala's is 52. About the highest in the world is 69. But um, uh, Guatemala is about the highest in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, to illustrate their income inequality in another way, 
Um, the richest 10% of Guatemalans um, earns uh, 34 times as much as the poorest 10%. They earn, the richest 20% earns 20 times as much as the poorest 20%. Now this compares to, with the U.S., 16 and 8. That is, whereas their richest 10% earn 34 times as much as the poorest 10%, our richest 10% earn 16 times as much. So even understanding all that you've heard about our own income inequality, um, theirs is significantly worse. I mentioned a rapidly growing population. I want to give you some specifics on that. Their, their uh, population growth rate is 1.82%. This is the highest in Latin America. There are nearly 25 births per 1,000 people. Um, that works out to about three children uh, per woman. This has declined significantly from several decades ago, but it's still the highest in the hemisphere. Guatemala has the youngest population in the hemisphere. Almost half the population is under the age of 19. Other aspects of, uh, of their demographics, uh, I think, adds to this picture I'm trying to paint of social complexity. Uh, while 60% of Guatemalans uh, have Spanish as their first language, the other 40% speak one of 21 different uh, Mayan languages or two other non-Mayan uh, indigenous languages. Now, I'm not talking about variations of the same basic language. Um, if you speak Quiche uh, or just Quiche, for example, uh, you cannot communicate with another indigenous person whose first language is Kachikel. Um, so the indigenous, indigenous community is linguistically uh, fragmented. Um, they find unity really only in their shared historical grievances. And they're typically able to communicate with each other only in Spanish, the language, of course, of their conquerors. Um, to introduce uh, politics, Guatemala's politics uh, reflects this social fragmentation I've been talking about. 18 political parties in a country of just 15 million people. 11 of those are new since I finished my own service in Guatemala 10 years ago. Uh, political parties, political parties are typically little more than a vehicle for the latest person to have gotten um, bitten by the urge to be president. Uh, they develop little infrastructure, a grassroots organization. They tend to disappear when the campaign for which they were created uh, is over, uh, particularly if it's unsuccessful. But even if the campaign was successful and they got elected, certainly by the time that person leaves office, it's an open question as to whether the party that got them there um, or that they whose platform they ran on is going to um, survive. Elections thus uh, tend to be waged since there's no get out the vote grassroots organization to do this. They tend to be waged exclusively through the media. And so the, the campaigns are expensive. Um, the business sector uh, can and does uh, finance political activity. They contribute to um, to campaigns, uh, typically supporting um, uh, parties on the center right. Uh, other parties don't have uh, wealthy donors to turn to. And, um, and in recent years, they've accepted funding from dubious sources, from organized crime, from the drug traffickers in particular. So as drug cartels have pumped money into political campaigns, that's had the, the kind of corruption of public policy that you would anticipate. Uh, Guatemala's political life is complicated in, in um, uh, numerous ways by the legacy of the 36 years of internal armed conflict that, as, as Larry mentioned, ended only uh, 19 years ago in 1996. Uh, that conflict left um, 200,000 dead. That's a staggering number considering that when we had a population of 35 or 40 million in our own civil war, we, we had only three times that number of, uh, of dead 
in our very bloody um, civil war. But they, they also had a, a million refugees, uh, plus several hundred thousand internally displaced people. Uh, the, it was the indigenous people of Guatemala that suffered the great brunt of this violence and dislocation. But everyone was affected, and each group has its own narrative of cause, consequence, and blame uh, that interferes with uh, any effort to promote national unity. Now, I've been talking about Guatemala's uh, demographics, a little bit about its economy and its politics, but you've already heard me mention uh, the United States a couple of times and uh, alluded to it um, as I uh, spoke about immigration and the drug trade. And I dare say that uh, while uh, most Americans don't think about Guatemala uh, very often, uh, the converse is not true. Uh, we loom very large uh, for Guatemalans, and we have done so for the last 75 years in particular. So I want to spend a few minutes talking um, uh, about this history. And again, Larry didn't know what I was going to talk about, but he, he hit on all of the high points. In 1954, uh, during the Eisenhower administration, the United States was responsible for the overthrow of a socially progressive um, leftist but democratically elected a government, the, the administration of, of uh, President Jacobo Arvins. Um, this was a duly authorized by Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles themselves, a CIA operation codenamed PB Success. Um, and it succeeded on its own terms. It had consequences that were enduring and pernicious for both Guatemala and for the United States. Uh, for the United States, the ease with which it succeeded created overconfidence that was a big factor in the planning for the Bay of Pigs debacle that took place only seven years later. In Latin America, the coup created uh, deep-seated, widespread anger. One of the Latin Americans who happened to be living in Guatemala, attracted by the Arvins government, which was the most progressive in Latin America at the moment, was a young Argentinian by the name of Che Guevara. Um, when the coup occurred, he looked around for the next best place to take his own politics, that happened to be Cuba. But the Latin American obsession with non-intervention in internal affairs uh, that persists to this day relates back to this coup in particular. And as the United Fruit Company had lobbied Washington for the coup, uh, the way American business was viewed throughout Latin America was adversely and almost permanently affected, even as um, I think American businesses today are really good corporate citizens throughout the hemisphere. Either they're still laboring under the, the legacy of, of uh, the impression that was created back in the 1950s. Now in Guatemala, the, the coup resulted in the installation in power of an army colonel by the name of Carlos Castillo Armas. His rule was so oppressive on a par with what Pinochet did in Chile 20 years later that it led um, almost at the same time uh, that the Cuban Revolution happened uh, to be the beginning of the armed insurrection um, that Larry spoke of and which I've already referred. So Guatemala's democratic development um, would suffer from 31 years of continuous military rule. Uh, civilian rule and free elections were not reinstated until 1985. Elections since then have by and large been uh, relatively free and fair. And by that I mean not that they've been perfect, um, but they've not been marred by you know, fraud, outright fraud, or stealing ballots, or by outcomes that didn't largely reflect the popular vote. Uh, U.S. policy in Guatemala uh, 
uh, changed substantially during the uh, Carter administration. The Carter administration became so concerned by violations of human rights uh, in the way Guatemala was conducting its counterinsurgency effort that it so heavily conditioned the military assistance we were giving them that the Guatemala themselves said, enough, we don't want your assistance, we won't accept your conditions. So it was actually Guatemala that suspended the program. Um, military assistance did not resume on a comparable level uh, until two or three years ago. We went from the period from 1976 until 2013 uh, with either little or no um, uh, military assistance to Guatemala. This was the case uh, even during the Reagan administration, by and large, uh, which had, of course, its own obsession with events in Central America. Um, at a time when we were putting massive amounts of assistance into El Salvador, uh, Guatemala was largely on its own in fighting its guerrilla insurgency. Now, when the Guatemalan military withdrew from the direct exercise of power in 1985, a succession of Guatemalan uh, civilian governments began to explore the possibilities of a negotiated peace with the four guerrilla groups. Um, these four groups um, had united into one, um, uh, known by its uh, acronym in Spanish of the URNG. Uh, they had done this under pressure from uh, the Castro regime in Cuba. Uh, but progress on getting negotiations with the URNG uh, going was fitful until basically three things came about. One is the Cubans had ended their support for the URNG, or they did end it in the early 1990s after the Soviet Union dissolved. Soviet subsidies of the Cubans stopped and Cuba's ability to support the URNG and anybody else abroad was severely dis diminished. The second development was, by this time, although the Guatemalan military had essentially defeated the URNG on the battlefield, the URNG was cleaning their clocks in the battle for sort of hearts and minds abroad. And this was largely the result of the publication of a book called I, Rigoberta, written by an indigenous woman, Rigoberta Menchu. Uh, this is an extraordinary book written in cooperation with a French anthropologist. And for several years, it was banned in Guatemala itself. But it was a huge international sensation um, in Europe and in the United States and Canada um, and Japan. Uh, it was translated into dozens of languages. And it basically told the story um, from the indigenous uh, perspective of, of what had happened during the internal armed conflict. And so um, the URNG may have lost the, the, uh, the military battle, but they really won the public relations and, and political battle. Uh, and this worked to bring about international pressure on the Guatemalan government and on the, um, and on the Guatemalan military to negotiate a final settlement to the still ongoing conflict. The final development was that after several years of unsatisfactory or little or no progress in negotiations that were being mediated by the Guatemalan um, Catholic Church, the Guatemalans turned to the United Nations. This didn't work out um, very well at first. Um, and, and the Guatemalans had turned to the UN because they were, they, the, both the military and the civilian government felt that the church was too sympathetic to the guerrillas and they weren't being neutral in their conduct of the, of the negotiations. So they turned to the UN but developed the same complaint with the German diplomat that, uh, that the UN appointed to mediate the, uh, the talks. And so they insisted to uh, the Latin American Secretary General of the United Nations 
uh, Javier Perez de Cuellar, a Peruvian, that the UN appoints somebody else. But this so irritated Perez de Cuellar that he, that he said, I'm, I'm just going to diss them. I mean, I'm thinking that's what he thought. Because he appointed a very junior interpreter at the UN to conduct the talks, a Frenchman by the name of John Arnault. Because he, it was, it, and the Guatemalans felt insulted that you've appointed this very low ranking man who doesn't even work the political side, he's an interpreter. John Arnault turned out to be a political genius a person of extraordinary diplomatic talent, listening skills, and in a matter of months, he had won the confidence of all of the parties to the negotiation, plus all of the governments that were interested in the process. Um, and, um, and ultimately, and about three years after he joined the process and took over the mediation, the uh, the last of six interrelated agreements was reached, and there was a, a final settlement. The guerrillas laid down their arms, rejoined public, private, political life, and there was remarkably uh, no settling of scores, as the euphemism has it, on either side. The military didn't go after any of the guerrillas and kill them, and the guerrillas didn't go after any of the military. It was, and that can't be said of Salvador, can't be said of Colombia when the M19, uh, some 10 years before, had laid down their arms. Now, the substance of the peace accords was almost uh, wholly compatible with our own national interest and foreign policy objectives in Guatemala. Our, our agenda focused, and still does, on strengthening democratic governance, uh, promoting economic growth, reducing poverty, uh, improving respect for human rights and strengthening Guatemala's capacity for professional human rights respecting uh, law enforcement uh, with a particular focus on the drug trade and combating uh, gang violence. Uh, now, except for the anti-drug effort, uh, which doesn't, by and large, uh, hasn't succeeded in engaging the Europeans, these objectives are also supported by the other major donors uh, to Guatemala, which are the European Union, um, Japan, and the international development banks, the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. So in all these programs, we have a special focus on uh, strengthening civil society organizations and all of the wide variety of endeavors in which they operate, uh, which tend to be better governance, more transparent, uh, transparency in government, human rights, environmental protection, and poverty reduction, just to name a few. This effort through our foreign assistance programs to promote a more vigorous, robust civil society has actually been pretty successful. And you can see some of the success in the kind of outpouring um, of public protest of the last several months. These, this was civil society responding uh, in an organized, uh, very peaceful way uh, to express their outrage. Now, as Larry said, and, and you're probably aware, uh, it was these protests um, came about because last spring, the special uh, UN International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala known by its acronym in Spanish, CICIG, CICIG, announced uh, the findings of its investigation into a contraband or, um, organization that had been countenanced through bribery at the highest levels of government. Um, CICIG first identified the sitting vice president, Guatemala's first ever uh, woman vice president, uh, as being involved in this. She resigned, was arrested, is in prison, waiting jail. Uh, but then, uh, in three months later, they found pretty conclusive evidence to their mind that the president himself was probably actually running this contraband operation. 
and uh, the same public outrage then focused on him. Um, he resigned, was arrested, is in jail awaiting trial. Um, as Larry also indicated, um, elections were already uh, about to be held. They were held, and two rounds of uh, voting eliminated the candidate who just three or four months before had been everybody's bet to be the next president. Um, because the, the feeling was he's in the hand of, or in the control of the pocket of the, of the drug uh, cartels. And uh, the Guatemalans elected a professional comedian uh, who had never before held elective office, never before served in government, appointed or even as an employee anywhere. Um, and uh, they clearly felt that the lack of experience notwithstanding, he was still the best bet uh, of the people who were running uh, to act on a reform agenda. Um, on the positive side, uh, this man who, by the name of uh, Jimmy Morales is asking the UN to extend its presence in the form of this investigative commission um, through the year 2021. And he's also asking them to vet uh, the people that he is contemplating appointing to his cabinet and other high, high office. Whether CSIG will um, take on that responsibility is another question. Um, Ten years ago, one of the incoming governments asked us, will you, you know, conduct a background check on all of the people that I'm thinking of naming to office? We said we had to pass on that. We just couldn't take on that kind of uh, respond, moral responsibility for, for the people. Now, uh, Morales' party, uh, the National Convergence Front, uh, on the negative side is largely the creation of former military officers, some of whom have these same problematic histories uh, in the, during the internal armed conflict of human rights violations. So I think the, the sort of the sense of achievement that they managed to throw the bums out and their hope that this represents a turning point for the better are tempered by you know, an awareness of the failure of similar moments in the past uh, to produce a you know, um, a genuinely democratic uh, Guatemala. And, and it's tempered as well by an awareness of the problematic nature of Morales' party. So I think I'm going to pause there. I took the 40, oh, you don't, oh, okay. Go ahead, applaud. <laughs> Thank you. I can just take, I can just recognize people if you like, Larry. So we're ready. Does anyone have any questions they want to start with? Would you mind walking back there? You mentioned that there's a very young population, that there's a large input of money from outside the country. What kind of unemployment is there among the youth in Guatemala, and what's going to keep them together? It, it sounds to me like it's not the, the economic uh, vitality is not in Guatemala. It's, it's coming from outside of Guatemala. Well, it's, it's not, at least not to the degree that uh, would be required to sop up this um, unemployed uh, portion of the workforce, which tends to be young, uh, poorly educated, um, lacking the skills. You know, Guatemala has an economy that's really moving, that's predominantly now services. Uh, more service, services, you know, or if you divide it between services, agriculture, and um, manufacturing, uh, services is about 55 or 60 percent of, of the economy. This would re require a skilled, well-educated workforce, and um, Guatemalans have never invested, say, the way Costa Rica has in public education. Um, the, you know, at a, at a time in Latin America when most economies got in trouble by taxing too much 
and borrowing too much. Uh, Guatemala was at the opposite end of the spectrum. They taxed too little, and they borrowed too little. Their governments were unable to invest in public infrastructure and unable to invest in public education. It's been the private sector um, which um, has had a stranglehold on, on these policies of not taxing more heavily, not taxing heavily enough to give the government any wherewithal to uh, address some of these basic needs. And the rationale they use, and it's not without a, a good deal of truth, is the, 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 the government is too corrupt for us to have confidence that if we paid a higher level of taxes that the monies would be well used. Show us you know, that you're going to be honest and transparent in your use of public monies, and then we might think about it. But it's a kind of vicious circle where all of the problems of being a chronically underfunded government you know, crop up in a, you know, a, a police force that is uneducated, poorly paid, and relies upon um, um, you know, scamming everybody that they come, uh, ripping off everybody that they come in contact with. Um, it results, in, as I say, in, in not putting enough money into education, so they don't have the, the skills that they now need to, um, to, um, to work in a modern economy. So it's not a pretty picture. Um, but you know, one of the agreements in the peace accords was that Guatemala would raise um, its level of taxation to 12% of GDP. Anybody got an idea what percentage of GDP we raise in taxes? We are a pretty low tax country ourselves, but we, and, and we got, we've gotten up to as high as 23%. Currently, we're between 19 and 20%. So Guatemala has always been right around 10%. And with 10% of, uh, you know, of a $75 billion economy, you don't have a lot of, of money to work with to do what um, needs to be done to, to begin to address uh, the kind of uh, problems that, uh, that you allude to. And that's, so, you know, it's, it's so complicated and, it's so, and the, the problems are so intractable and it's such a mix of, of, uh, of history and of, and of ingrained attitudes uh, that, um, that it's really hard to be terribly optimistic about Guatemala's future. That said, you know, there are some glimmers of hope here and there. I'll try to... I think I should take another question before I try to think what those would be. <laughs> so I was uh, wondering, after uh, 10 years after CAFTA has been passed, what its effects have been on Guatemala's economy over the last 10 years or so? Yeah. You know, um, CAFTA is the Central American uh, Free Trade Agreement uh, between the United States, uh, the Central American countries, and the Dominican Republic. Uh, I think, um, you know, they weren't as immediate uh, and as helpful to the Central American countries as NAFTA was to Mexico, uh, basically because, um, I mean, the hope was that um, all of the sort of the, the rules that go into a free trade agreement would make all of the Central American countries as they adopted these rules governing customs, governing you know, the way they, uh, they regulate um, uh, foreign investment and international commerce with them. So for the, the whole idea of free trade is less about the reduction of tariffs than it is about sort of setting world-class standards for the way you do international um, trade. And, um, but the problem is, even as they have made some of the reforms called for under the CAFTA, uh, they still have these terrible problems of, of um, criminal violence. And they have this uneducated workforce. And um, 
and the poorly developed infrastructure. And so that's held back investment. And so the growth hasn't been yet as much as they had hoped for. It's also the case that the Central Americans uh, really negotiated um, a slow reduction of, of the uh, tariff levels. That's why you can still have a contraband scandal. You know, contraband only works where you've got a differential between prices between countries and you, you go buy stuff where it's cheaper and you bring it back in and then the scandal results when you're buying off the customs officials and not paying the tariffs. When you eliminate tariffs, you know, you're not going to have any more contraband because you don't have these price differentials. But um, they negotiated in a, a schedule of reduction of tariffs that's only now really beginning to kick in. So the effects um, have been slower. I, I, I'm personally a big believer in free trade. I think the kinds of things that free trade does will be destructive of the sort of the stranglehold that the Guatemalan business class has had on politics and public affairs. And so I think it's going to be very healthy, not only economically, but socially and politically in time, but it hasn't happened very quickly yet. Yes, sir. I comment on that. Uh, some of our companies in the U.S. that deal with Guatemala, uh, clothing manufacturing being prime ones, uh, basically shrug it off when they're accused of participating in the corruption by uh, dealing with middlemen who uh, Guatemalan who hire the workers and then just fail to pay them or uh, basically steal their wages and then either close the shop up and disappear. And the American manufacturers shrug it off and say, well, you know, we deal with this or dealt with this person and we don't have any direct connection. So shouldn't there be some better way of requiring American corporations to uh, deal more transparently or well you know i i really just in my experience which with respect to guatemala goes back to the early 1990s when i from washington began dealing with all of central america i just don't accept your premise that american corporations are are behaving like that even in the textile industry the korean textile industry is you can't say enough bad stuff about the way they've comported themselves in Guatemala and elsewhere in Central America. But the American textile manufacturers have been pretty darn good about respecting uh, the kinds of standards that we expect of them. You know, even before we negotiated the free trade agreement with, with Central America, we were extending unilaterally trade preferences going back to 1975 to all of Latin America. It was, we did this first under the Nixon administration. And uh, it was, you know, the Latin America was at that time saying, uh, we don't, we want trade, not aid. And it was their catchphrase. Uh, but just give us access to your markets and we will develop and so lower your tariffs. And we did. And this was called the generalized system of preferences. But our labor unions, to their credit, said, all right, but if you're going to do that, by golly, the, the rights of, of, um, of the, the workers in these countries have got to be protected. And so there was a process called uh, petitioning where American labor unions, which have an overseas presence in all of these countries, professional you know, they're just like AFL-CIO diplomats. And they monitor labor conditions. And uh, they can bring a petition before uh, now the, either the Department of Commerce, uh, it's an interagency panel that looks at these petitions, to withdraw the trade preferences that have been given if the, um, if the workers' rights are being violated in the country. And this has had a a huge effect of improving uh, you know, and, and, and largely doing away with the kind of 
situation that you, that you describe. So, um, sorry, I just don't ex agree with you on the facts. <laughs> I'll disagree with your agree, disagree okay. with, but, uh, <laughs> Okay, we can, we can agree to disagree. Uh, now comment. your question. <laughs> uh, there's, one could draw parallels between uh, the politics down there currently and politics in America currently. Uh, the difference between uh, Morales and Trump, for instance. Uh, as people, the publics in both nations get more and more fed up with the way politics has been carried out, uh, we can end up with outsiders getting an inside track that uh, may not be warranted, but that's what you get when, when the public feels that they aren't being served by the politicians that are there. Uh, you see those parallels yourself and... Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. But you know, uh, I can't come up with his name. Uh, who's the uh, comedian? Uh, Al Frank... Frank... Uh, Franken? Yeah, Al Franken. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm just having a senior moment here. He's turned out to be a pretty decent uh, senator. Yeah. Very serious senator. Um, so... You know, I, I still want to hope that Morales uh, um, will, uh, will prove to be uh, um, an Al Franken of... Well, of do you attribute some of the changes that are occurring to the access to the Internet and the... Well, yes, it's the Internet all over the world has facilitated. Because the way they, the, the way they organized this was, was through Facebook. Um, they evented, they created something, I'm not even sure what it is, but, uh, you know, an event page on Facebook and it got the instructions out uh, as to how they wanted everybody to behave so as not to uh, provoke uh, a police uh, reaction or, or repression of it. Yeah, they did it all over the Internet. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned the United Fruit Company uh, mm. earlier. I, I believe they were what, the largest landowner in Guatemala for a long while. They were, yeah. Uh, what's the situation with that now? And I'm kind of curious how that, uh, the legacy of that affects your work is, at the ambassador's level. Well, um, you know, I think, as I indicated, that um, the, the impressions created uh, sort of when the behavior of American businesses in Latin America was the worst are, are, are really slow to change. And uh, it takes an awful lot of consistent good behavior to even begin to have um, uh, the Latin American publics, and particularly the parties that are by their own ideology prone to be critical of the United States, which tends to be the ones that were on the left. So it's, a, it's really hard to build bridges to that part of the political spectrum um, um, when you're dealing with some of, the, some of this history. And the history doesn't really go away. It generally fades on into the past, but it's still there, by golly. Yeah, Memories are long. Um, but you know, American ambassadors uh, support American interest across the board, and that includes American business. But, you know, I think we've done a good job, both through our legislation, um, federal legislation passed by the Congress that sets standards for the way American business conducts itself. American businesses are subject to federal prosecution if they engaged in bribery. Um, I'm going to have my Jeb Bush moment here and bash the French. But the French can um, deduct on their taxes the cost of doing business, which is a euphemism for uh, paying bribes to foreign officials to get contracts and this sort of thing. When they're operating in cultures where that's the expectation, American businesses do that, and they can find themselves being prosecuted by the Justice Department. I don't know whether I'm really answering your question or not, but... Um, well, I, I was just curious, you know, how difficult it makes your job to have that history uh, and influence on... Yeah, it makes it, 
it, it makes it more complicated. But I think, you know, I think the antidote to all of it is to, uh, to be aware of the history and to um, sort of be sympathetic to those sectors that feel that they have a grievance that hasn't gone away, listen to it. I think with that kind of attitude, you can ameliorate kind of sort of the, the, the sharp edges of the, of the feeling against the United States. But let me say, I meant to say when I was talking about immigration, we are in the process of doing more injury to ourselves and the way we are seen in Central America by the nature of our public discourse around the immigration issue in this country. Guatemalans, Salvadorans, Hondurans, Mexicans follow our public discussion of the immigration issue very closely. And just as Hispanics in this country profess to be very deeply offended by the way they get talked about, uh, so too. And uh, this was true when I was ambassador, and my goodness, that was 10 years ago. And uh, it's only gotten worse since then. And we are just, we are just doing ourselves, because we are sending a message of the way at least part of the American public views people from that part of the world. And it's not pretty, it's very insulting, it's deeply offensive, and it just makes me cringe every time. I'm glad that I'm no longer the ambassador there and having to try to explain that kind of language. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. is a very personal question. Um, a friend and I have reservations to go to Guatemala in late January, early February, to study Spanish for three weeks. To Antigua? Yes. Mm -hmm. My husband's very concerned, and we're, we're somewhat concerned, too, mm -hmm. about the political situation. You know, I don't think you need be. Um, Antigua's really very safe. Um, Hundreds of thousands of Americans go to Guatemala every year. Only a very few have difficulties. Um, those difficulties have been fewer and fewer over the last 10 or 15 years. The Guatemalans have really um, made an effort to, um, to, uh, to make tourism safer. And I think they've largely succeeded. Uh, how long are you going to be there for three months, did you say? Weeks. Three, three weeks. weeks. Three weeks, yeah. You're going to have a, a marvelous time. Yeah. The schools there are, there are about 70 different language schools there. Yes, there are a lot. Um, you know, Antigua itself is um, a world heritage site um, built where the original capital of Guatemala, when it was still a Spanish colony, was until uh, series of earthquakes culminating in a 1773 earthquake that was just catastrophic, um, had them move the capital to its present location in Guatemala City. But it's right between three volcanoes, and these volcanoes look like the way grade school children draw volcanoes, you know, going up like that. One of them is still very active. You could very well, you know, be seeing flames like like the flaring of a, of a gas refinery coming up out of them at Don't night. Don't scare him. Hmm? <laughs> Don't scare him. <laughs> oh, no, no, I don't. They have had to uh, occasionally shut down uh, the, the airport if, the, if there's a lot of ash coming out and the wind is blowing toward the, toward the airport. But I don't think there's any danger to people in Antigua. We had also thought about going to a different school in a different location, but we've, we've sort of decided maybe we should just stay in Antigua. Yeah. You know, I would, I would say, too, um, if you go to a restaurant sort of at night for dinner, um, 
you know, get back reasonably early. Yeah. Yeah. Choose a place to where you know the streets are well lighted. Right. But um, Antigua, even long past the hour at which I would predict you and I, you know, would want to be in bed. Uh, the streets of Antigua are teeming with young people, and you're going to feel pretty safe there, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, you've really been an attentive okay, audience. One oh, one more? I get to ask a question. Oh, okay. Um, oh, go ahead. I still get my Two question. more. Two more. Uh, my son's adopted from Guatemala, and I huh. uh, wanted to bring our family back, but I was just wanted to get your idea about the sentiment of the Guatemalan people towards adoption, because I know it's now closed adopt to um, American yeah. families to adopt. Yeah. And um, so your question is, what just, are the, what, is how do Guatemalans view? How would we be perceived in Guatemala? Oh, I think you'd be welcomed. Um, you know, we, we, we did eventually have to um, shut down the, the adoptions for fear that there were abuses being uh, committed during the process, not by the Americans, but by the Guatemalan legal profession. Uh, but as ambassador, I loved it when Americans adopted children from Guatemala because, you know, I can't think of a more sort of organic joining of our two societies than to be joined at the family level and to take Guatemalan kids into American families. And then as they are growing up, if you can get them back so that they learn about Guatemala, I just think that's wonderful. And I, I, and I think you know, Guatemalan public attitudes would be very supportive of it. Okay, thank you. That's not to say, you know, you could run into some Guatemalan nationalist who doesn't like it. But I think by and large, uh, Guatemalan people um, really admire Americans for the kind of humanity that's sort of manifest in their wish to uh, adopt a, a foreign child. So. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, in today's New York Times, there was this article which I showed you earlier, mm -hmm. in which she kind of, in a vague sort of way, compares the political changes that are just happened, the election results of just a week or two ago uh, in Guatemala, compares it to the opening up of a new kind of democracy. And she talks about being a democratic spring, and she's comparing it to the Arab Spring in the Middle East. I think that's a fair comparison, and, and her, her implication yeah. is that things didn't go work out so well. Uh, people lost enthusiasm for it, and the same thing's going to happen in Guatemala. The corruption is going to live on. Yeah, I, um, you know, the problem when you try to make these um, sort of analogies is that um, somebody always finds something wrong with it, and I, I think I know what she was. Uh, suggesting and and um, I mean we all had hopes for the Arab Spring that by and large have not yet uh, been fulfilled but I think a better comparison might have been say to um, 1993 something very similar happened in Guatemala in 1993 when the sitting president carried out what was known in Guatemala as a self-coup an alto golpe he suspended the Constitution um, shut down the Congress, started ruling through uh, decree and um, arresting some political opponents. Uh, but he'd been freely elected. And, um, but there was a, uh, we came out very strongly and early and unequivocally in opposition to it. And there was this public outcry, uh, a kind of uprising of civil society from the far left to the right. And uh, he was forced to resign, and he fled to Panama, where he lives on his ill-gotten gains still today. Now, as a result of that change, you had a transition government headed by the man who was the human rights ombudsman, um, 
you know, a, a wonderful person. And then you had arguably the best government that Guatemala ever had, which was the government that negotiated the final peace agreement with the, with the guerrillas. Um, but then slowly things slipped back. The government that followed that one was the one that was in office when, when I got there. That president, by the way, the one who disarmed me by saying, oh, it's actually much worse than you think. Uh, he was convicted of money laundering by, uh, under US law, extradited to the United States, and um, served um, two years in a federal prison. Um, he's, he's now out of jail and back in Guatemala. And for time, it looked like he was gonna run for president again. But, uh, but uh, you know, I think that would, you know, the reason that I'm still very cautious about whether um, Guatemala might really manage to get on a, a, a more a surer path to honest and, and um, 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 accountable government on this occasion is because I've seen these moments before and it just didn't work out. And I think maybe in some ways, ways we've talked about, the present moment is less auspicious than even the earlier one was. So. Um, but I, you know, but I don't give up on Guatemalans. There's just, as, as I say, there's just all of that natural ability and talent down there. So. Dave, you won't, oh, this, Dave gets the last word. Okay. I, I can't help but uh, make the comparison between what we in the West laughingly considered the banana republics of the world and the fact that their uh, candidates for leaders were usually family members or close business associates. Uh, is there any comments made in those countries now about America when we have brothers the, the, and The Clintons and the Bushes. And, yeah. Yeah, and the Kennedys before that. And um, um, uh, yes, there are. Um, by and large, I would say Foreigners across the board, even our closest and dearest friends, kind of love it when we, uh, when we give them some cause to, uh, to find fault with us. It's, you know, yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, okay, are there any so, other questions? Yeah, anybody else, and then. Well, thank you. You've really been an attentive Let's audience. Let's please give this gentleman a round of applause.